I would like to uh, welcome the students of Anaheim University uh, to this opportunity to uh, uh, discuss marketing and to show some of the uh, latest uh, ideas that uh, characterize our field. Thank you very much. Mr. Kotler, many companies still use the practice of mass advertising. Do you think mass advertising is effective? And if not, what are the drawbacks? My uh, simple answer is that mass advertising has lost a great deal of effectiveness, and I'll explain why. Uh, before doing that, let me say strongly that there are mass markets. They will continue to exist for ordinary things like clothes and food and so on. Um, we used to be able to reach mass markets very efficiently uh, through television and print, particularly because um, we had fewer media available and more people would be loaded on each medium. Uh, today, uh, the media is so fractionated, we have so many different ways to uh, reach people and people are spending their time in so many different ways that uh, we would have to spend a great deal more money on many, many media to somehow reach uh, a person. Uh, furthermore, people are very busy doing other things. Uh, they are um, listening to uh, uh, music, they are not uh, watching the media, they are on the computer, they are doing aerobics, they are running and so on. And so uh, we have to find new ways to reach people. Um, even when someone is in front of a TV set watching a commercial, uh, they are half watching the commercial. In fact, uh, we, we sometimes call this the bathroom break when a commercial comes on. And even if they paid attention to the commercial, we, we feel that most of those commercials have been a waste of money. Uh, they have not been even remembered. Uh, they were seen, but not remembered. Um, it's, there's a skepticism, too. It depends on who we're talking about. The younger people today are very skeptical about advertising. And so we, uh, as a, a profession, have to find new ways to achieve reach and credibility. Uh, we've lost a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So when do you know you have a marketable service or product? What strategies can we use to determine if a given product or service is really marketable? Well, you know, we go through the normal process of uh, new product development which, with its uh, six to eight stages, and we have what is called a stage gate system to kill a bad new idea as soon as possible or to let a good new idea go through the process. Uh, remember, the cost of developing new products increases as you get to the later stages, so we really want to screen out some bad ideas early. Now, um, we use focus groups in part. Uh, that is just taking six to ten people to talk about the new idea. They would be people who would be in our target market, and <clears throat> if they sort of do thumbs down, uh, we probably wouldn't go much further. Uh, not that we would rely on just six to ten people. We would probably replicate a number of focus groups until we get a consensus. I remember doing this for the Volkswagen um, uh, smart car. Actually, it was a Mercedes smart car where we did several focus groups and uh, asked the question, would you buy this car in the United States? And we were consistently getting the answer, no, it's too expensive, it's not safe enough, and so on. But let's say the focus groups are positive. We would go through uh, more depth interviewing, one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, then we uh, to see if the product is really marketable, if there's some kind of way it, it is, it's meaningful. It's meaningful to the people who we would like to sell it to. Uh, we would go through um, survey work, and in the end, we would probably um, know if uh, the project should continue on. Uh, one of the things I look for to know that a product is marketable is that there's a, a real value proposition that is clear, uh, it's distinctive, uh, it's compelling. Uh, so that would mean that we would not introduce another car, another toothpaste by itself. That is not the way modern marketing works. In fact, we are so embarrassed by the high rate of new product failure, which is about 80 percent 
in the case of consumer packaged goods. I mean, with all that we know about the process I just described, we should never have a failure. And we still have 80% failure. So the question uh, of how do we know if a product is marketable um, is, is a big uh, question mark now. Um, one of the things that, that leads to another question, and that is, um, how do we know um, uh, what, what's behind the failure of a, a lot of our new products? And there the answer is, one, sometimes the product lacked a, a meaningful value proposition, a compelling value proposition. Two, it was a good value proposition, but the price was too high. Uh, three, the market didn't quite understand the product, especially for radically new products, like a what's a VCR, what's a Palm, you know, where what was needed was not advertising, but education. And marketing education, that is educating the market, is much more expensive than putting out some an ad. An ad. So there's a number of reasons that um, behind product failures. So what are the key ingredients in a good marketing plan? Well, what are some typical red flags that may indicate that a marketing plan is not going to work? Well, you know, I've looked at so many marketing plans. Uh, I've been um, invited by companies to audit these plans. Particularly, I did a lot of work for IBM uh, where I was sort of a second guesser on how good the plan was and I would have, and I had a scheme for evaluating the plan and then often we would send the plan back to the planner and say hey it's the objectives aren't clear the strategy isn't clear what I found in a lot of these exercises is that the plan consisted of a lot of numbers and a lot of ads and no strategy in other words you'd go and look for some compelling uh, strategy that is bound to win and you couldn't find it so what makes up a good marketing plan? First of all, uh, objectives. The objectives have to be feasible. I mean, they can't be dreams. They've got to be attainable in some way. Uh, but even after the objectives are set out, uh, the question is, is there a clear and compelling strategy? Um, and, and that's guesswork to some, but is it at least spelled out? Uh, let's say the strategy is spelled out and looks good. Are the tactics, which is the actual implementation, the, the choice of a real price, a specific price, the communication strategy, the distribution strategy, um, all those details, are they worked out and aligned with the strategy? I sometimes find a disconnect between the strategy and the tactics. Now let's say the tactics are well worked out. Then I look at the uh, question of the, the budget. Uh, and putting the budget in the framework of a return on investment. I mean, for that budget and for given what we expect to attain in the marketplace in the way of revenue, uh, are we getting back a return of, let's say, 20% on our, on our investment or 30% or is it just 5%? And then does the plan have good controls? Um, that is, uh, every month uh, we have spelled out uh, where we want to be and we can look back and, and check on whether we got there and if we didn't, we could ask a set of questions. When we don't attain uh, in, a, in a plan um, the, the numbers we want, we have to say, well, we're, did we not spend enough money to get there? Uh, oh yes, we spent enough money. W was the mix of expenditure on different programs and on the four P's, product, price, place, and promotion wrong. Uh, no, those were okay. Well, maybe uh, we didn't have the right strategy. We didn't do the right segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Oh, well, even if we did, were the objectives sensible? So when we look at a plan, we ask a whole set of questions about, um, uh, about is it a good plan, is it a feasible plan? So what would you say has been the most successful marketing campaign that you have seen? Well, you know, um, that's a good question because I do have the feeling that not more than 10% of the ad campaigns, uh, advertising and marketing campaigns, are truly outstanding. 10%. Maybe another 30% are okay. And then I'd say almost half of them were a waste of money. 
Now, what would be a successful campaign? I like to um, look at um, Absolute Vodka. Along comes a brand of uh, vodka which suddenly takes over the market. Now, vodka is a commodity. In fact, it is, it's got to be of a certain kind of consistency, it's spelled out chemically. So it's got to be a, a differentiation in the mind, not in the product. But look what they do. They develop a wonderfully clear bottle, kind of nice Swedish look to it. Uh, and by the way, vodka should really come from Russia, not from Sweden. Secondly, they run an advertising campaign based on art, art. Every month you'll see a new vodka, uh, absolute vodka ad uh, with, with the bottle somewhere in the picture. Well, isn't that a reinforcement to see the bottle again and again? But the puzzle of where is it and the cleverness of how they created this ad and the fact they engaged artists to compete to do vodka ads for absolute. Um, the result is they're, they're one of the world's leading brands now with a commodity uh, uh, as the subject. Now, are there other campaigns that have been outstanding? Absolutely. 10% uh, of them have been. There's a book written by Hamish Pringle. Uh, he is a, um, an advertising expert in England called uh, Great Advertising, and he has 20 or 30 campaigns in there, which he documents as having been excellent and effective campaigns. Um, but that doesn't prove that he's covered the universe. That's the 10 percent he found. Um, but I believe that the question is a basic one. Are the ads creative enough? And my answer is no. They aren't. Why? Where's the creativity? Most of it is humdrum. Most of it is lifestyle. Two women washing clothes and one woman says mine came out cleaner. So I've asked this question of ad agencies. I've said, why aren't your ads more creative? And they say, well, we give the advertiser a creative ad, but he's scared. He's afraid. He wants to sort of tone it down a little bit, not take a chance. Consequently, um, uh, they settle for a mild ad rather than a wild ad. Uh, I've often said to um, advertisers, ask the agency for three ads, a mild ad, at the other extreme a wild one and one in between, and then you make the choice. But my main point is that the ad agencies blame the advertiser on being too risk averse, and the advertiser says, no, I didn't get a really brilliant campaign. But notice the point that I'd like as a takeaway. Great ads can make a world of difference in a product success, but we don't get enough great ads. I see. So uh, then what are the most common mistakes companies make in marketing their products or services? Well, uh, I would say that um, they have not developed a compelling value proposition um, that is clear and something people will really feel they need. Uh, they have mistargeted sometimes. They've gone after a segment that is not the right segment that would be interested in this offer. The price has been set in the wrong, at the wrong level, maybe too high for the market that would be interested in the product, but not at that price. The product, uh, this, the channels where the product is available are not matched to where the people are who want the product. And we can go on and on. We would just say that there's either been a failure of segmentation or targeting or positioning or one of the four P's, product, price, place, or promotion, or service has been suspect. That is, you buy the product, but can you have it fixed up if something goes wrong easily? Can you reach the company on the phone? There's uh, dozens of reasons why uh, companies may fail when they launch a product. Mm -hmm. So how has marketing's position in business changed over the past 30 years? Well, um, it's very interesting. I would say that marketing in some companies at the beginning uh, m m managed to be the driver of the business's strategy. 
that, I mean, of all the functions, marketing was the one driving the strategy for that product class or category. An example was, is Procter & Gamble. Uh, when Procter & Gamble started the brand management system in the 1930s, they said to the brand manager, you're totally responsible for the business. Now, is that true today? Today, when a brand is developed and given to a brand manager, his or her power is very s circumscribed. Uh, and what comes out is a patchwork of inputs from the finance officer who wants a certain price, from the manufacturing people who um, say they can't deliver the qua that quality, but they'll deliver what they can, from the um, engineers who may overqualify, make too much quality for the uh, price that will be charged. Uh, so somehow we want teamwork. We always want teamwork to be behind a new product, but there should be a driver. There should be someone who really makes a consistent uh, communication program and quality program and so on. And there isn't. What I'm saying is that marketing in some cases in the past was a much stronger driver than it is today. In fact, in the worst cases, marketing has degenerated into a 1P function. And you know what that P is? Promotion. You go into a marketing department in a large company and you find that most of the people there are working with advertising agencies and PR agencies and sales promotion consultants. And, um, and it's about promotion. What about getting the right product out and service to go with it and the right price and the right channels of distribution. So unfortunately, marketing has been marginalized in, in, in companies and my goal is to get it restored to being the driver of the strategy around that product. So what are the most intriguing theories of marketing that have recently come to your attention? Well, there's always uh, new themes, and uh, among them are first uh, the great attention being uh, paid to branding, brand positioning, and also what we call brand asset management. The brand being an asset that has to be managed carefully to making sure that it isn't misused. For example, Coca-Cola would be making a mistake if they made a Coca-Cola toothpaste. The name has to be what it is. It's about drinks and good refreshing drinks. Um, so brand skills are very now high on our list. In fact, you know every week there's a new book written by and published by someone on branding. Every person who's ever worked in marketing or advertising has to write his own theory. Um, but that it's good that we sort of uh, respect what we call brand equity. We're a company we sometimes say is its worth is measured by its brand equity. You know, the idea has been stated that Coca-Cola could sell its own brand name for $70 billion. That's what their brand equity is worth. Okay. Another concept is customer equity. Customer equity is, what is the value of your customer base? Am I, if I'm a physician and I want to retire and sell my practice to you, um, how much would you have to pay for the patients I have because I'm really my practice is a set of patients who will continue with you hopefully uh, that's customer equity it's an interesting concept and it's related to brand equity but um, we use them a little differently another theme is customization and personalization we're reaching a point where in many cases we can make an offer for that person not a standard offer that Everyone has to accept or reject, but one that's customized for that person. Um, it's like Toyota saying, we can make the car you want. Now, not any car, but we can offer you the camera with the features you want. Takes a little longer, a uh, week or two, but put in the order. But aside from cars, this is already well done by Dell Computer. You actually uh, tell Dell what features you want in your computer, and they price it out, and, and that's what you get. Now, customization is going into a lot of areas. Uh, 
uh, Levi jeans. We'll make a pair of jeans for you for your size and so on. Give them your measurements and you get uh, a special pair and then you can renew it. If you haven't gained or lost weight, uh, you have exactly uh, your measurements. Personalization is part of this. It's to not only um, make something for someone, but to, to, to know them better, to know them more personally. It's not, uh, dear sir, it's, uh, dear John, we remember your interest in the following thing, and we'd be glad to provide something for that. Now, another theme or direction uh, uh, for new thinking is called experiential marketing. And by that we mean not just giving some service, but creating an experience. So you go into a restaurant, and sometimes you come out saying, what a restaurant, what an experience. Look at the way the waiters handled it. Look at the way the place looked. Well, restaurants taught us that, that you can market more than food. You can market an experience. That's what uh, was behind Hard Rock Cafe and some of those other organizations. Now, a retail store could be an experience. Like we now have Nike Town, a three-story uh, clothing store, basically. But you go in and there's a basketball court, so where they sell the basketball shoes, you could try them on, you can try to throw the ball, see if it helps, if those shoes help you throw more, uh, a better basket. A ball. Okay, so uh, there are uh, more people are saying we we all started in this field looking at physical goods. Then we added services. Now we're creating experiences for the customer. And by the way, the customers experience any company in so many ways. It's an experience of the company when you make a phone call and try to reach uh, the company. Uh, and what happened? Did you reach them? It's an experience when you see, we, we often say there are so many touch points where an impression is being formed of a company. So that means that we want to move to something called integrated marketing communications. That's another idea, namely that let's let there be in a company a CCO, a chief communication officer. And that person should be able to um, um, uh, not only integrate the advertising, but integrate the clothes that the staff wears when they meet customers, the look of the trucks, the look of the company's offices. So the CCO, Chief Communication Officer, uh, should be there to integrate every impression that the company is making. And, and for example, if it's a company that wants to sell to the high end of the market, then this CCO is going to pick very high end um, magazines, um, we're going to have quality in every uh, uh, thing they release. Uh, they will uh, charge a higher price. Their product will have higher quality. Everything will be integrated for high end. That's what I'm talking about. So there are many themes, new themes, uh, that we are um, using in marketing. Can you briefly describe customer relationship management? What are some of the benefits and drawbacks of CRM? Yeah, well, CRM um, has been very popular in the last uh, few years, uh, and yet very criticized in recent years. Uh, of course, the theory goes like this. Let's go away from um, um, treating even just segments. Uh, it was a, an advance when we went from a mass market approach to defining segments. But within a segment, people are still very different. Even if I say <clears throat> the segment of teenagers, let's, let's have a, some product, let, let's make a camera for teenagers. But teenagers have many, many subsegments, okay? But even if we define the subsegment like um, Hispanic teenagers, uh, they, they will still differ among themselves. So we get to the point of saying, in CRM, we should have something about each person in the segment. We should at least know their age, education, interests, income. And, and many companies are now collecting pretty specific profiles. Why? Because let's say I have <coughs> the names and information about 5,000 Hispanic teenagers, okay? I could do a mass mailing to them with an offer for some music or something like that. But, you know, that, that's a lot of postage. 
maybe I should use a technique that we now call predictive analytics, which when applied to the 5,000 Hispanic teenagers will choose those, a subset of those, who have a better than 80% like uh, probability of positive response, that they will buy the offer. Maybe that will turn out to be 800 of the 5,000 that have an 80% probability of buying the product. So I send the offer to just the 800. I probably will hit something like a 20 to 30% response rate, not the old 1% response and 99% wasted mail. My mailing cost is much less because I'm mailing to 800 people and not 5,000. And that's the essence of CRM thinking. If we knew our individual customers, we would pick the right ones to reach at that point in time. Great idea. Now, uh, it's, it, it, co it requires a lot of cost. What? First of all, gathering all that information. Secondly, hardware and software. Um, and then, uh, remember, we have to keep that information up to date. For example, some people move. 20% of us move each year, so we'd have to find new addresses. I mean, there's a lot of cost to CRM. Now, it may be worthwhile, but I want to make this point. CRM is not worthwhile for a number of companies and types of companies, and I'll tell you examples. Coca-Cola should not get into CRM because there are two billion people drinking Coke. It doesn't need anything, any information about them. It, it would be unmanageable. What are they going to do with it? So for consumer packaged goods and low-cost items, I don't see where those firms need CRM. I'll make an exception for some companies like the Kraft Company, um, which uh, has 110 million names of people who like cheese and so on, and they run a whole relationship with them. That, that's a different kind of thing. Um, I don't think a company needs CRM if it, is, if it loses something like 30, 40, 50 percent of its customers each year to, to others. For example, cellular phone companies are experiencing a lot of switching. Every time the subscription expires, some um, cell phone user finds another company that will be cheaper. So you lose half of your database. I mean, all, after having all those names uh, and, and all the information about these people, all of a sudden you lost it. So CRM isn't uh, good there either. Um, CRM is mostly useful where you, you're going to learn about customers who buy more than one of your products. They buy a number of your products, and like Sony. I, if Sony could get the names of, um, of the people who like to buy electronics, and I'm one of those, by the way, they'll notice that I bought their digital camera. They'll notice that I bought uh, a Walkman. Uh, they'll probably send me more offers. So that's where CRM would be very useful to identify high electronic users. Um, now, what are the main failings when CRM is proper to use, but where it has failed. It had failed in companies that thought of it only as a technology, and they did not set themselves up as customer-centered companies. They were not customer-centered. They, they didn't really run them. They were product-centered, and they had different product divisions that didn't talk to each other. So somehow, though there's names of their consumers somewhere, no one's taking a 360-degree view of the customer and all that he might buy of the different products the company makes. So one of the big mistakes has been that it's been adopted as a technology, but it wasn't fitting the company's state of mind, which was that it was a product-centered company, not a customer-centered company. And then there's been hardware and software problems, uh, bugs that came up in the CRM system, lack of the right information, like the make most critical information for predictive analytics might be a guess at the income of the person, and they couldn't ever get those numbers. So I think any company interested in CRM should tread very carefully. It can work. It has worked brilliantly in some cases. It has failed terribly in some other cases. 
What marketing advantages does the internet offer that other media do not provide? Um, the internet is is explosive and revolutionary in, in its potential for marketers. Uh, let me list some of the ways we would probably probably uh, and profitably use it. First of all, uh, as an information highway, every company can learn so much more about the marketplace, about customers, about competitors by going on the internet uh, and listening, eavesdropping, in chat rooms, and so on and so forth. Um, even customers, a company could set up a customer panel, a dealer panel. An example would be we choose 20 of our long-term customers, or 100 of them, and say, would you mind being on a panel? Which really means that uh, from time to time we'll ask whether you could get on your computer at 8, 8 p.m. at night, and we're going to show you a new product we're developing or a new ad campaign and just getting your opinion. And, you know, you could use your computer to chat. And therefore, you can run a focus group right on the computer. As for competitors, you can uh, say you want your, your page to uh, produ reproduce any information about a competitor of yours. You want every mention in, finan in the financial press or anywhere else to be daily listed. So someone is collecting competitive intelligence on a regular basis. Um, you can use the internet to sample um, people where you you might make the kind of product that is uh, small and not costing too much and you can say to people they can get a sample of it by just emailing the wish to get a sample to you. You can um, offer coupons to those people who write for a coupon, we'll print it out for them and they can go into the supermarket and get 10, 10 cents off, 10 percent off or something like that. Uh, that's what was done with Toys R Us. Toys R Us said, uh, before Christmas, why don't you just write to us and um, we'll send a coupon and you give it at the checkout counter and you get your cost down. Um, there, uh, many companies uh, at the very least need a good uh, web page. And I'm disappointed in the web pages. I, I find some of them download very slowly. They're they have too much cuteness, you know, and, and I don't need that. I want to get to uh, what I want to get to. Um, there's no reason to have a, a poor web page. Your own user, uh, consumers who use it can tell you what's wrong with it. Or you can go to experts who can evaluate the web page and say that uh, it's hard to go from one part of your web page to another. Um, certain things are not clear. Uh, too much color or too little color and so on. Uh, but I think that um, the real question is often raised, will the uh, Internet serve as an advertising medium in the future uh, to the uh, comparable to TV and 30-second commercials? No. First of all, people using the, uh, the, w the Internet would resent it. We don't want pop. We don't like pop up ads. In fact, we can block them now. Uh, there is advertising going on on the internet, there's no doubt, uh, but it will be a very small part of the experience of the internet. So don't think of its great new um, use as being a giant advertising medium. No, its great use is it's an information highway that goes both ways. It helps the company send information, it helps the company read information about others using it. So what is the greatest change the internet will bring to marketers over the next decade and <clears throat> how can companies ensure that they take advantage of these benefits? Yes, well I, I've covered some of that and uh, um, the, the thing is that I would say a company should be sure to appoint someone in the marketing department responsible for exploiting the internet in all the ways that I listed um, and not only leaving that in the hands of a person to do it but rather 
educating everyone in marketing on all of these benefits and uh, potentials and in, 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 in getting acquainted deeply with what the internet can do. That is to say, we don't want to lock it in one area of a company. We want the company to be using the internet for all these uh, wonderful opportunities. While we're on the topic of the internet, do you agree with Peter Drucker in that online education will play a major role in the future of higher education? Uh, yes, I, uh, I agree with everything that Peter Drucker says. Uh, he's one of my uh, heroes. Uh, but with respect to uh, education, I think it could be a powerful force in education. Uh, I'm not saying we're not going to need teachers and mentors, but frankly, if someone said to me, can a child get a pretty good education if they never met a teacher but was motivated to learn and could only have access to the Internet? I'd say yes, because everything's on the Internet. Uh, every course you could imagine uh, and so on. Now, of course, it could be shapeless. The kid can go to, from one place to another without a kind of a, uh, a learning about the great ideas and the great um, um, pieces of knowledge they should have. Uh, the real point that Drucker is making and others is that it, the, the computers and the Internet ought to be in every school and every teacher should be teaching with the Internet as a platform for the learning. And the assignments should drive the students to go to the Internet for information uh, and, and for chatting with others and for searching you know, you're, you can reach, if they're doing a, a paper on Nigeria, they could actually chat with someone in Nigeria. So I think it, can, it, it must be part of the educational process in the future. Let's talk about marketing influences and marketing visionaries. In your book, Kotler on Marketing, you list Akio Morita, co-founder of Sony, as a marketing visionary. What was it about Akio Morita's marketing vision that impressed you the most? Well, I think he, he was a, a giant in, 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 in the ideas he brought to, uh, uh, to, to not only Sony but to the whole business world. Uh, let me be specific. Um, first of all, he made a statement in his book, uh, Made in Japan, that he doesn't serve markets, he creates markets. Now. What he's really saying is that there's different ways you could be good uh, as a businessman. You could be good at, at copying others. For example, um, Panasonic has been uh, described as sort of doing very well by not originating a lot of things, but watching what Sony does, and coming out with their version, maybe a little less expensive, and so on. That's been a battle between Sony and Panasonic. Um, but you notice what, uh, Marie, uh, the, what he did. He said, uh, we are not just um, running after other products and copying them. We are uh, creating new things. And in the book, uh, he lists so many new things that Sony has done that we've never, besides the Walkman. The Walkman is well known. And of course, he came out with the, 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 the beta approach to the VCR and all that. And that there was a whole issue there. But so one of the things is, creating new things, innovation. Second thing is when Sony would come out with a new product like the Walkman, he would ideally like to set up three teams uh, to uh, manage it through time. The first team would be sort of making it a little better, giving it a different color or bringing it into a different um, target market and so on. The second team would be trying to think of uh, a, a more substantial way to improve its performance, maybe to make a tape tw last twice as long or something like that. And the third team, ideally, would be working to obsolete the product, to make something so much better than it that Walkmans would no longer be around. Uh, so uh, this idea, the second idea was has to do with how you manage a product through the life cycle. You don't just make it and keep it fixed in its attributes and so on. And that fits a, a, a Japanese notion that the Japanese people have taught us, and that is continuous improvement. 
not only towards zero defects, but to better and better products. Um, I would just say that uh, Sony has exemplified uh, innovation, creativity, uh, uh, quality uh, throughout its history. And who has influenced your marketing theories the most? Well, uh, first and foremost, Peter Drucker, who, though he is described as the father of management, is in a sense the f a father of marketing because Forty years ago, he said things like, the only two functions that count in a business are marketing and innovation. All the other functions are costs. He also said 40 years ago that the purpose of a company is to create a customer, not a product. And he was prescient in seeing that. He also said 40 years ago, something that I thought was so perceptive. He said, the aim of marketing is to make selling unnecessary. Now, we always thought marketing was selling. But what he was trying to say is that the aim of marketing is to come out with something that's so good and people are so ready to, to buy that you don't have to do more than just inform them. There's no hard selling involved. So he's my hero. The second hero is Ted Levitt, uh, who was a professor at the Harvard Business School and wrote a number of wonderful articles in the Harvard Business Review, uh, maybe the most famous of which is um, Marketing Myopia, where he distinguishes between a, um, a product and a need. The need is there, but the product may change. The need for calculating is there, but we don't have to use a an abacus or a slide rule maybe an electronic calculator will be better for that. So, and then another article on globalization of marketing and, and, and the value of imitative marketing is sometimes as good as uh, originating marketing. That is just copying, but being a fast copier. So Ted Levitt is uh, highly respected by me. There's a person less well known, John Howard, who wrote some early textbooks, which I thought had quality to them really uh, deep thinking, and um, they came out in the 50s. And then uh, another is Roe Alderson, who did not write textbooks, but wrote uh, like m monographic books uh, with brilliant insights and, and, cis and original theories, um, difficult to read, but Many, but there are many followers of Roe Alderson's approach to marketing. And um, those are some of my heroes. Now, there are some practitioners who I admire greatly. Uh, I think uh, Richard Branson, Branson uh, in England, uh, with his virgin line of products, uh, is just brilliant. I think um, the person who started Starbucks and what he's doing with Starbucks, uh, of course, we can go back to Ray Kroc at McDonald's, which created the whole fast food industry and, and so on. Um, I once prepared a list of 20 or 30 of those business people who were so creative in marketing. When you talked about Ted Levitt, you mentioned about the globalization of marketing. What impact has globalization had on marketing? Well, it's, it's had and is having a profound impact. <clears throat> globalization really means that we've made it easy for companies to move into other countries uh, and use them as a source of supply or to um, uh, move into other markets and compete in those other markets. In other words, we've lowered tariffs so that there could be better movement of capital, of people, of goods and services around the world. Now, what's the implication? What it means is, first of all, we can bring down the cost of living. The fact that uh, we can um, import products from China has reduced the world's cost of living, basically. Secondly, we can, as a company, have a much larger volume because we're not restricted to selling in our own country. 
we can sell around the world. Well, that means economies of scale. And that brings down the cost to a company when it can spread its manufacturing costs and other costs over a larger volume. So I would say that globalization basic contributions has been to bring lower costs to the world and to bring better products around the world because in the past countries and consumers in those countries had to accept whatever was made. The big story used to be that the Russians, uh, when they could only buy Russian-made products, uh, would buy a television set and there was a 5% chance it would explode on them. That's how badly they were made. Today, you can go and buy the best sets you want wherever they're made and it gets pretty clear who's making them. You've talked about uh, Sony, Panasonic, and Toyota. How do marketing approaches in Japan differ from marketing approaches in the U.S.? Well, we have learned a great deal from uh, Japanese uh, business practices. Um, one of them, for example, is uh, zero defects. Um, we got away with murder in the United States with respect to our products. I bought a, uh, a Buick uh, once, an uh, American car, and uh, I had to take it back uh, a day later after buying it to be fixed up. And the dealer said, well, don't worry, you're not going to pay any more. Just bring it back to us. And I said, well, why do you let the product come through this far? Why isn't it perfect at the manufacturing point? Well, it's just cheaper to let all the cars be made, whether they're made as well as possible or not. And the dealer will find a, a mistake or two, like the customer comes back, as you did, and uh, we'll, we fix it. Yeah, but what about my, my time? Okay. The Japanese taught us that they, we should aspire toward zero defects. And whenever they experience a defect, they ask the five whys. Why was the production bad that day? Why was it that worker who didn't, um, uh, who was perhaps drunk that day? Why was he drunk? What kind of problems has he been having in his life? Before you know it, they get to understanding why things go wrong and reduce the chance of things going wrong. All right, that's one thing. That's related to wanting the highest quality. Quality to them means zero defect. Two, uh, they taught us continuous improvement that you don't just uh, set the parameters, make the product forever that way. You keep asking, how could it be better? Which really means you learn from the marketplace. You, you measure satisfaction. You ask customers uh, for their views on how a camera could be improved or a phone could be improved. Um, and then I think third, besides uh, what I call high quality and, and, high and continuous improvement, uh, there's a better service concept. Uh, you, you see this in the Japanese department stores. I mean, even walking in, everyone, you're greeted and so on, and, and, and the manners. You know, the Japanese have a word for customer. I think uh, when you translate it, it's honored guest. The view of the customer, not as a pain, in, uh, a pain but as uh, someone who's an honored guest who you would treat as if uh, they were in your home. Uh, is something we need to bring into the United States more. more. There's several other dimensions, uh, quality circles uh, that the Japanese uh, use and others, uh, other things that have been contributions to um, global management. Let's talk about the people that work in marketing. What qualities in a person should marketing departments look for when recruiting new staff? Well. It depends on whether we're talking about marketing staff or sales staff. Let's take marketing staff. Uh, you know, marketing is that uh, uh, group that the marketers who prepare the whole program that is applied by the salespeople and the others. Uh, and it's more analytical work. Marketing people are, you want them to be two things. You want them to be analytical where that works and creative. 
because they have to imagine a strategy and, and uh, communications that are going to be catchy and all that. So uh, there's a number of sub-skills or a skill set that marketers should have. Of course, it even will vary with whether they're doing the, they're the marketing research person, what are the skill sets there uh, to do good research, whether they're the uh, communications person, what are the skill sets, whether they are the uh, channel and distribution uh, arm of the marketing department. So it's hard to, um, to say something very general. Now with respect to the sales force, what should they be good at? And here I would say don't hire any salespeople who are not people oriented uh, because interpersonal skills and relationship building skills are so important. Uh, you want your salespeople to know their product, not only know it, but love their product. By the way, one difference between Japan and um, the U.S. in favor of Japan is that the Japanese companies, when they hire marketing people, are really putting these people initially in the factory. At least that's the way I knew it was done by some companies. Because that way they get to know how the product is made. They get to almost respect it and be awed by, by it. And then maybe often they're not transferred into marketing. They're transferred sometimes into purchasing. We don't do that. When we hire a marketing person, he goes right from an MBA program into marketing. All right. But, and, and when I noticed this in Japan, purchasing, why? When you're in purchasing, you're going to meet salespeople who are trying to sell their products to you. And you'll get a sense of what is good selling and bad selling because you see it right in front of you. And you can model yourself after what you see is very effective selling. Then after being in purchasing, I think you should be in, in, in the sales department, not the marketing department. You should be selling. And then if you still want to do marketing, all right, maybe it's your chance to do marketing. So the Japanese firms that I've noticed um, in some cases have a whole different way of training you, giving you a skill set uh, for marketing than we do where we just uh, take you from an MBA program and put you into marketing. So what should one look for when hiring an advertising agency? Well, I would say that we should invite at least three to five agencies in to begin with and um, look very much at for their creativity, not their cost or their, just their ideas. And I've often felt that it's almost a mistake for a company to only have one ad agency because then the creative ideas they're going to get are going to come from one group. I'd even argued sometimes that we should buy advertising ideas. We should, we should tell five agencies, we're going to pay you for ideas. If you were to market uh, this toothpaste, this new one we're talking about, tell us what you would do and we'll pay you for it and, and give you, uh, you know, we'll get the property rights because we're paying for the idea. Uh, too often when you have only one agency, that agency thinks a certain way and even if they give you th three ideas from mild to wild, they're within the same frame. Okay, but in the end, if you're going to use one agency, um, uh, there's, uh, not only would I, I want to appraise the quality of their ideas, and of course I'd look at their past campaigns and measures and I want to show I want to see not only the advertising I gotta know if it worked much advertising is arty you know and it's even remembered by people but it never sold and remember what David Ogilvy said it's not it's not effective advertising when it's just cute or arty it's got to actually sell so I want the agencies to tell me uh, what the return on investment was for their campaigns in the past. What metrics did they use to show that the campaigns were profitable? And then the last thing, not the last, but one of the things I would want is pay for performance. I would tell any agency that I'm interested in hiring that they're not getting a straight 15%. They're getting a variable return 
based on how well their advertising performed. And there are ways to sort of say this. Um, if, the, if our sales went up when you did our campaign, you'll get 18% commission, not 15%. If the sales have been flat in spite of your campaign, you'll get your normal 15%. If our sales go down, your advertising didn't help. You only get 13% and a warning. That's called pay for performance. It's being practiced by P&G now and a couple of other companies. And maybe some ad agencies soliciting my business will drop out, but I've, I want to stay with those that will meet that criteria. <clears throat> what aspects of marketing should companies outsource to consultants? Well, you know, uh, marketing outsources most of the things. We outsource our marketing research. I mean, there's a marketing research director, but he uh, hires field workers and a uh, agency, a uh, research agency. We outsource our advertising. We outsource our sales promotion to a consultant on sales promotion. N normally, if, unless you, if you're a very large company like Procter & Gamble, you're going to have your uh, sales promotion people inside. But medium-sized companies, they, they, who are looking for sales promotion ideas, they will go to a consultant. Uh, public relations is often outsourced. Um, and so basically, uh, even the management of a loyalty plan, let's say you are going to offer points to people uh, for the, the, rate, the level of their purchasing, just like an airline has a frequency program. Um, running that, you probably are going to have it run by someone else for you. So marketing is, uh, does a lot of outsourcing. And uh, it's a matter of size. When does it pay to, to build a whole advertising department of your own and do it internally, which DuPont used to do, uh, or any of those other functions? And when, or when does it pay to buy it from the outside? Make or buy is the question. And I think there's a lot. And if it's more effective and cheaper to buy, you outsource. When doing a marketing consulting assignment, what are some of the first questions you ask your client? Well, um, I want to get at the basics, uh, like why are they needing that information? What, what information do they think they need, and what would they do if they got that information? Um, I like to tell them the following story. Um, a consultant could put a question to uh, a company, what time is it? And, and get three different answers depending on the company. One company might say, uh, I'm sorry, depending on the consultant, uh, let's say what I'm really saying is a company should uh, ask its consultant what time is it. Some consultants will ask, answer this way, it's uh, 11 a.m. and 30 seconds. Well, what that kind of consultant is going to give you a very accurate set of facts. A second consultant might say, what time do you want it to be? Now, that's not the kind of consultant to hire. They're going to make the answers please you. The third consultant would say, why do you want to know? That's my kind of consultant. Why? So I would say to a company that invites me to consult, uh, what is this all about? What are the issues? Uh, are you asking the right questions? When you say you want that information, is that really the right information that you need? So uh, basically, I will put a, um, uh, a company through a set of questions before I accept the engagement. Where do you see the future of marketing heading? Well, I, I believe that uh, one future for marketing is what I call technology-enabled marketing. Um, we are going to make use of much more technology in approaching customers. Um, there's a thing, for example, called sales automation. Uh, sales automation 
uh, is equipping the salesman with his computer and his cell phone so that when he goes or he or she goes into the office of a customer is able or enabled to answer any question that the customer might ask and to make decisions based on those questions. For example, um, a customer may say, I will buy your product if you can deliver it in three days. Can you? S through sales automation, the salesperson can go to his computer and say, I'll check. Yes, I can get it to you in two days. But I don't like your price, says the customer. It's a little too high. Can you come down in price? I'll check. I can give you 2% off. That's all I can do. I don't want to lose your business, but I can cut the price by 2%. Fine, says the customer. Then the customer says, but I don't like the uh, provision in the contract, paragraph 4, because it puts too much risk on me. And the salesman says, well, let me check on it. Let me change it. Is this satisfactory? Yes. Do we have a deal? Yes. And then I print out a contract as a salesman. And basically, what the salesman was able to do because of sales automation is to act like the CEO of the firm. He could answer every question right in the office. He didn't have to go back to his company can we ship in two days? Can we price lower? So sales automation is one example of using technology to enable a salesman to close on a sale by answering every question that might come up. Secondly, there's a thing we call marketing automation now. There are many decisions in marketing which do not require human judgment. It can be done by a software program. It's very much like the fact that the world's champion chess player today is not a person. It is the IBM machine and software. Okay. Now, if chess, which is a very complicated game, can be handled by software, why can't we handle some decisions in marketing? Example, the airlines and the hotels are eager to promote uh, sales when they find out that there's a lot of rooms left unsold or some airplane flights are going uh, off in two days with only 50 percent capacity. So there's a thing we now call yield-based pricing. Example, we have a plane that's going to leave in two days with only 50 percent of the seats sold. We immediately send a message to travel agents that the price has been reduced. The travel agents immediately send a message to um, retired people who can, on the spur of the moment, take that flight. And they're waiting for such announcements. And all of a sudden, they fill the plane 100%. Now, all that is automated. We are automating such things as the craft company uh, will do a display of its cheese in the whole cheese section and know what cheese to put where and for what store. Because if the store is in a low-income area, it's a different set of cheeses. It's less expensive cheeses. And so they use a software program to actually do shelf um, location. Um, that's all called marketing automation. That is to automate a number of uh, our decisions. Now, there's another thing. We're making more use of uh, dashboards. What's a dashboard? Look at your computer screen. Think of it as a dashboard. Just like a, a, a pilot flying a plane has a dashboard, lot, lots of uh, meters and so on. OK, one use is called a performance dashboard, a marketing performance dashboard. We arrange your screen to show you all the information you need on a daily basis to make decisions in real time. Uh, for example, I may be a brand manager, and I was hoping to sell 5,000 units in Chicago uh, during this quarter. So I look, hey, we only sold 3,500, but I have three salesmen in Chicago. 
How come we didn't sell the 5,000 that we expected? Salesman one, I can drill down. Oh, yes, he did very well. Salesman two did okay. Salesman three is way behind his quota. Now, let me look up his record. Oh, my God, yes, he's had a, a history of some over-drinking sometimes. Maybe he's got a, a problem. I've got to call that person. So I'm using my dashboard to, in real time, keep us moving forward and diagnosing any problems that are coming up, getting red flags. That's called a performance, marketing performance dashboard. Then there's another kind of dashboard, again, as part of technology-enabled marketing, which I think is the future, and that's called a process dashboard. Every marketing process uh, has a set of steps, and each company has to decide on how it wants that process, the steps to be done. And some companies, like Procter & Gamble, have a whole set of written material. If you're going to do a concept test, do it this way and so on. Why should it be written material? Why shouldn't a brand manager at the company who has to do a concept test, never has done one before, go to his computer, type the word concept test. On the screen it says three steps in the concept test. Step one. And not only does it tell you what step one is, but it gives you tips on how to do it, and it gives you an illustration of how it was done on a recent product. Then step two, step three. Now, so what's in the box now? A mentor. Not a live mentor who's an old timer in the company sitting over your shoulder and saying, I'll help you do your concept test. I don't need him. It's all in there. And that's called a process dashboard. A set of, now, all kinds of processes, how to do a test market, how to hire an ad, ad agency. So when you ask about what is the future of marketing, it's going to become more technical, especially with direct marketing and so on. Now, another thing in the future, marketing is going to become more financial. The big friction between the vice president of finance and the vice president of marketing is that one talks the language of finance and the other talks the language of just spending a lot of dollars and not knowing what's happening. Okay, so the real question is, is how to build a financial mindset in marketing people where we could ask them this question and get an answer. What was the return on investment of that campaign? Uh, how much money did we make with that new product? And, and that's what we are, are, are going to do. Now, Coca-Cola recently did an interesting thing on financials. They've told their marketing managers that whenever they are running a campaign to estimate in advance what the return on investment would be using a certain system of what do you think the awareness will be, what do you think the interest will be, what do you think the preference will be. But anyways, let's say I'm about to I'm at Procter & Gamble, I'm about to do a campaign, uh, or at Coca-Cola, whatever, and uh, I, I estimate that this will give a 20% rate of return on our investment. After I run the campaign, I do a post-estimate. Hopefully it's 20%. Hopefully it's not 2%, which was a disaster. Hopefully it might really be 40%. I was wrong. but. What that does is, see, it's, it's guesswork, but the main thing is it starts making me as a marketer think financially. So it's that mindset that, that will be in the future of marketing. We're going to create. Now, some people object to that. They don't want to be financially liable because they say it's marketing so messy. Um, how do you know uh, what a mass advertising campaign really did? Uh, and it will affect our creativity because if we start thinking of the financials, we are going to be more risk averse. So we won't do some risky things because maybe they'll be great or they'll be terrible. So some people are worried about making us more financially oriented, but that's part of the future. So we're going to get more technical, we're going to get more financial. So finally, what advice do you have for someone just entering the field of marketing? Well, um, first of all, they should clarify what kind of marketing they're 
interested in because marketing is a mansion with many rooms. For example, if they are attracted to marketing because they like to do research, be a marketing researcher, uh, then there's a, they should know themselves well enough to know if they have the skills and the patience and, uh, to do this. Uh, if they want to enter uh, sales and sales management, that's a whole different kind of person and lifestyle and so on. Uh, if they want to be a vice president eventually of marketing of the whole function, uh, there will be, they would have to be able to work with many other functions. They'd have to be able to uh, uh, hire very good people to work for them and to, um, uh, and, and, and to know that the average marketing vice president may last five years before the CEO says, I need someone new because we're not achieving our objectives. So you could enter marketing in many, many parts of it and just make sure that you have the interests and the capabilities to be very good at that part of marketing.